Um, this is Michael. He is like probably one of the most knowledgeable people I have ever met when it comes to stucco. He, he actually has provided quite an education to me working with him over the last couple of years. And I'm so glad he was able to join us today and share his knowledge with uh, our attendees. There you go, Michael. Thanks, Shancy, very much. And just everybody, the collective group of HomeGage, thanks for having us today. This is a, a fabulous presentation we're all experiencing and, and benefiting from. Uh, Excellent. Briefly, we're located in southeastern Pennsylvania. We're nationally licensed through EDI, which is Exterior Design Institute. They're down in Norfolk, Virginia. So not only am I a licensed inspector, but I'm also one of their instructors. This past three months, I did some instructing for them, continuing education. My background is I am a masonry contractor since 1987, so historic and custom new. And what I wanted to do for everybody today was to sort of bring about, I know I've got seasoned professional inspectors here, and uh, you know they may touch or they may be aware of some of the specifics of stucco, but I wanted to walk you through a, a history lesson of how we you know, arrived at where we're at today. Again, we're, we're in southeastern Pennsylvania, which kind of has that, that dubious distinction that we have so many failures of stucco, and a lot of it is because of the region we live in, and a lot of the uh, propriety the items that we have in some of the construction through the years, that whether they're proprietary or whether they're, you know, uh, national standards, a lot of failures were happening because of the weather patterns we have. And that was also coupled with uh, a lot of the variations in people trying to pursue better energy efficiency. So I'm going to kind of walk you through the world of, uh, like, navigate through the seas of stucco, as I call it, all right? So this is the... Uh, sort of the, the abbreviated version of the basic navigation through the seas of stucco, and we call it the estuaries of EFS, E-I-F-S. So a lot of times people will have a vision of what they think stucco is, or uh, have an idea of how it's been applied. But there's two distinct situations that we have. One is stucco, which in its classic term, I'm gonna show that with you. And the other, which became more prominent down south, Florida, Texas, the Carolinas, was a newer evolution of a product called EIFS, Exterior Insulation Finish Systems. And why we do that is because the, the world of stucco inspections, the two of these sort of merge, and part of it is to identify what is what. So we're gonna go through a little history here. So this is the definition of stucco. It's a noun, fine plaster used for coating wall surfaces or molding into architectural decorations. And, and the, in the verb usage, to coat or decorate with plaster, a stuccoed house. So how we came about with these more, as, as Shancy mentioned, some of these acrylic texture systems was that after World War II, there was a lot of revolutionary materials that were being created in Europe. And insulation was a concern moving forward. And so to incorporate applying this product on the exterior of the home required some insulation and without having to do work on the interior of the home, they were trying to effectively marriage two things together, using the exterior existing of the home and then adding these polymers or these resins to, to the exterior to create a uniform stucco looking. Ooh. Are you there, Michael? System. So Michael, in the United Michael, States, the maiden oh, sorry, became known as EIFS. The Drive It company that everybody calls this system is a manufacturer. And they set sail for the journey in, in, from Europe to Providence, Rhode Island. And that was in 1969. It was primarily for commercial use only. So it had a lot of the building trades looking at this, but it was primarily used as an alternative product in traditional framing. As we progressed. Michael, Michael, I'm sorry, I want to interrupt you for just a minute. I wasn't sure if you were meaning to share your screen. Mm -hmm. Is oh, it not sharing? No, no, you, no, it's not. At the bottom of your screen, you want to, we see you, which is fine, okay. but we're not seeing your PowerPoint. So at the bottom of your screen, you might see a green button that says share screen. Okay. Share screen. Here we All go. right, and and uh, yeah, that's fine. I just want it. I'm on. I'll tell you when I see your Thank screen. You. Perfect. I don't see it just yet. Do you see it yet? 
No, I still see you. So I don't know if you have to turn off your, I don't think you should have to be a, turn off your camera. Let me see. Share. Let's try this. Let's try. There that. we go. I think there we got it. Now, yeah, yeah your, your screen is pulled off. Perfect. There we go. Got Perfect. it. Perfect. Thank you. Great. I'll move that down there. Great. Thank you. So uh, we'll step back for a second. This is the, the, the visual of the definition of stucco sort of gives you the images that I think most of us, regardless of where we live, East Coast, West Coast, I know we have so many participants today, uh, but overall, classic stucco usually resembles a lot of this. This was the history of this, we'll say a storm. This rising top was these EIF systems, EIFS, again, exterior insulation finish system. The commercial manufacturers in the 1980s, that's where it primarily was here. And like all great American ingenuity, people try to uh, redirect and, and try to create something new, which is exciting, but sometimes uh, you miss some of the components. So what was interesting about the 80s and the, the stringent guidelines for commercial codes was that you also had these smaller copycat companies that were emerging in residential communities. And they weren't going through the guidelines. They were sort of buying some of these products and, and incorporating their own makeshift as opposed to the true Drive It brand system, right? It was, a, it was an amalgam of multiple components to create the system. So we start going, through, I call this my winds of change. In 1991, uh, lots of issues were happening similar today. We've had some different uh, situations with the COVID virus. There's a lot of things that have changed economy. So in 91, post savings and loan bailout then, uh, the federal government was trying to boost the general residential housing economy. So there became this rapid growth of this EIFS system as opposed to the traditional stucco that we had experienced for 50 or 60 decades prior to that. I should say five or six decades, 50 or 60 years. So the perfect storm really happened in the, in the early to mid 90s. And we came about it as masonry contractors. We were aware of this. So my background is, you know, 1987, we started our own masonry construction business. And I'd say probably by the mid 90s, I was getting calls from a lot of the relocation real estate firms that I was a masonry contractor doing work for them. And they were asking me to go out and determine visually only if there was a, uh, a stucco system and more specifically, was it an EIFS system? Was it this drive it, this foam system? This seemed to be in the, in the world, the only thing that was a problem. So how we came about this was that in 1994, just as a comparison, 35% of new homes in the So EIFS system, what's this in the Carolinas, had some type of EIFS system. That's pretty interesting. So what really happened? What, what happened was system failures became evident. Again, we talked about not having the full system, but they were sort of making these components or adding this and doing on their own. They weren't using the approved system as done by Drive It Corporation. There was moisture and mold that was becoming prevalent behind it. One of the key issues with stucco and or its counterpart is that they look great from the outside. That's probably the biggest comment I get when somebody's asked to engage our service. But the home looks great. That's fabulous. Part of the issue why we do this inspection is because it's not what you see from the outside, although that's certainly something that, that bears reckoning. It's what's really going on behind the system. So progressing, uh, building inspectors and manufacturers were being, no, no pun intended, but they were being flooded with complaints and it began to look for these answers. So they found out it was a combination, not just of, of improper systems, but poor quality windows, improper flashings, no sealants or little sealants, and they were allowing water to flow behind the EIFS system and trapping it. And that was creating mildew, wood rot, insect infestation, insect infestation, and in some cases, structural damage. Most of this was related to the, uh, a lot of the relative humidity in a lot of coastal communities where these 
homes were being built what seemed like almost overnight again in that later part of the late 80s and the 90s where we were spurring, the economy was moving, and a lot of these systems were just coming up and they really didn't have a lot of the inspectors for the community or for the zoning looking that detail at some of these newer products. So I look at this as the, the last speaker that was here, we talk about who do I call There's a lot of volume. So as of a lot of this, this failure that was taking place, there started becoming state and local ordinances where requirements for third party inspections to be done in both residential and commercial. And, and as you would expect, inspectors need specific training in new construction as well as existing homes with stucco or EIFS. So what, what we start with, obviously besides getting all the the uh, credentials and, and getting the, the licenses and, and your business. So we could talk about that towards the end, if anybody's looking after the fact to get involved in something like this for incremental income. Uh, we only offer stucco inspections, stucco EIFS systems. And in some cases we have thin applied or manufactured veneer that are applied to the same system that we'll show you. Uh, so the big thing that you're doing when you go out to an inspection, when you're you know, consulted to do so, is you've really got to identify what kind of system. The apps that are there, all stucco is the same and all EIFS is the same. The applications may be, but the materials that they're applied to dramatically change based on readings. So I'm going to help you navigate through that. So the EIFS, we talked about this, exterior insulation finish system. It's acrylic materials applied typically to foam, which that foam is attached usually to gypsum, like a, like a drywall product, or a wood substrate in a wood framed home. And stucco, when it's not applied to directly to block or to cement or brickwork, when the substrate is actually wood, uh, it is typically applied in Portland cement with wire mesh or wire lath, as we call it. So those are two distinct systems that we have. One is more of a very lightweight, dense foam with a fiberglass mesh. And the other is a more traditional, as you would envision, Portland cement based applied to wire mesh. So let's, let's take a little cross section of what they look like to give you the distinction. So this is what an EIFS system looks like. So if you can see the, the picture here, pictures it's mesh it's fiberglass and there's different densities or thicknesses of the mesh depending on whether you're using a residential or commercial system so now you're actually impregnating two systems into one this base coat or this this acrylic product is infusing into the mesh and it attaches to the foam system and then you have this very thin finished texture that everybody classically identifies as this pebbled or this uh, acrylic texture finish. So this, if you were to knock or touch it or scratch it, it has a very hollow sounding, but a very uniform texture. It's very aesthetically pleasing. So here's some of the details of what goes on behind it. It'll be a little more, you know, in depth of what it looks like so you can get a, a better handle on the, the broad nature of application. So this is a system, and these are the panels that we talk about. These are the EPS, extruded polystyrene. They're foam panels. And they're being applied to the substrate material here. And the substrate is a gypsum board, sometimes called dens glass. It's fiberglass impregnated, and it's the substrate in lieu of plywood sheathing. This is a home that is framed primarily with wood, but the substrate material is not plywood. It is a fiberglass over drywall. Here's another little picture you can see. This actually has that primer coat. This is the next stage. This is before it. So this is what the foam panels look like when they're being applied. This is now in the process where the fasteners have been secured. Normally there's a, a, uh, a glue or an adhesive 
to which these panels are initially applied to that substrate. Once that's there to concern about uh, wind, shear strength, all the rest of it, there's then a series in a protocol legend of where we place the fasteners, where you're now fastening the foam directly to that dense glass or the substrate material. That's the, the, the securing of the system. And you'll see some of these yellow things. This is See the fiberglass that's being great the system, you're making sure that you give yourself adequate fabric of the mesh. The next step is we actually do, uh, you actually have to rasp the foam. You literally take a screen on a blade, similar to like a carpenter's rasp, and you file this all down, uh, and then you put you, any slivers that are available, you make sure that all holes have been filled, and it's now ready for the primer or the base coat. Michael, this is now what it Michael, looks like. Yes. Michael, I'm sorry. I have some questions coming in. Do you want to sure. stop periodically and answer them or would you prefer to wait till the end? I think what I want to do is let me go two more pictures and then we'll answer the questions. I want to get them comfortable with the EIFS here. Perfectly just so fine. I just wanted to make sure. That's fine. Perfect. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. So this is now showing you the patching of all the various fasteners. We have the, uh, the installation of the fabric and now we're starting with that a uh, base coat. And then this is the finish. So I'm not going to show you all of the, the method. The reason why you should know is because there's different depths of product. So when you're doing the test, I'm going to show you that in a couple of minutes, but I just want you to have a, a general idea of the history of how we got here and what's the difference between a EIFS system and now I'm going to show you the stucco or what we call hard coat. So Shancy, I'll take some questions. All right, great. And you may have covered some of this as you were going through because they were coming in for a few minutes. Um, someone said, uh, are you, can you talk about issues with insurance companies not insuring homes with EFIS or synthetic installed? I can. Uh, so again, you know, this is what I love about the home inspection community. I love this about the real estate community and now obviously with the home gauge community, the communications we have. As masonry contractors, we saw a regional concern as the real estate community and the insurance communities, they saw this as a national concern. So right away, a lot of these items were being excluded. I can't really comment on, on all the specifics of insurance. I know as a bonded inspector, contractor, That's uh, because they had seen claims that were evolving, was concerned about having transfers on relocation firms where systems had at one point only those that had this EIFS system. The traditional stucco or the hard coat, which we're going to delve into in a minute, that system was okay. So what I do know is that even up to today, a lot of the general home inspection uh, companies and stucco inspection companies like us will hear that the home insurance companies will exclude this from any coverage. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, all right, we have some older homes have stucco that is very, very hard. How is that different from today's products? That's a great question too. Uh, we're gonna get to that possibly next because that's part of this identification. Uh, in, in the world of stucco that's applied to, you know, I get homes, you know, we live in uh, historic Bucks County, Pennsylvania, where now we're north of Philly. So we have homes that are from the 1700s, 1800s, uh, that it was a, a cosmetic cladding where the very hard stucco, as you're talking about, has literally been a facelift over old brickwork or a cosmetic change over stonework that's 18 inches deep. We're not doing testing on those scenarios because when the stucco is applied to a true stone or a true brick product, we're not drilling through that to see the moisture content. We're, we're coupling our inspection to do moisture plus the firmness of the substrate that it's attached to. Stone is very hard as is brick, concrete, and block. Okay, um, let's see. What were the main years EFIS was used in Canada and other states? Oh, California. That might be CA, California. <laughs> it, so, it's CA. 
I, you know, I've spent some time, I'm also a, a national EPA instructor. So I've spent time throughout the country. I've, I've seen different applications. Uh, you really, I don't have a, a, a broad answer to that. Uh, California had a lot more contemporary style homes in the 60s and 70s, but this product really came about in 69, primarily in the East Coast. Again, it was in Rhode Island where it, it kind of had its maiden voyage. Lots of scrutiny, lots of the, uh, the powers to be in the building code were looking and monitoring to make a lightweight commercial system. It really started working its way west, probably in the uh, mid to latter part of the 80s. And same time also down south in uh, Florida, California, Texas. Okay. Um, I'm going to guess that you're going to cover some things about uh, common and larger cracks and structural things here shortly. Sure. So I'm going to just say that I, I figure you'll cover that. Um, I have someone saying, rasping the foam, polluting the environment with small bits of foam. Has anyone found a way to do this without releasing all the environmental contamination? What, serious question, what is the technical name of the practice of using acrylic top coat over traditional cement? So I'm not going to say that word right. Cementitious. Thank you. <laughs> Stucco base. And what are the problems and benefits of this system? Yeah, I think I'm going to go to that on the next one. That's a great question, too. Okay. Yeah, the last of the foam, uh, you know, I have to say, you know, for some of the, the, I have one video and a couple still photos that uh, you will see. And for the, for the video portion, you don't see me wearing a mask. But in my everyday environment of drilling through stucco, it is, a, it is a common practice that we wear N95 masks. It's just a normal, what we do when we go into homes, we always have uh, booties, masks, and gloves. It's standard practice. So uh, the, the, the viewer asked a question about uh, applying over a hard coat stucco in acrylic. That's sort of a hybrid, and I will touch base on that in the next uh, series of photos. Okay, yeah, I think a lot of the other questions you're likely to, why don't we just, if you go through several more slides and maybe in 10 or 15 minutes stop and we'll ask some more questions. Sure, great. Okay. Excellent. So I think Thanks. everybody's a professional now in, uh, in sort of identifying the, the, the quick overview of EIFS. Right? <laughs> okay. So in the world of stucco, Stucco is that, as we discussed, it's a in its hard or brick or stone or concrete substrate dense materials, because all those products could stand without cladding. You could have brickwork as, as it's done since the 1700s with no additional cladding. You don't need to put plaster over brickwork. You don't need to put plaster over concrete. It's not aesthetically pleading, but at least it's functioning engineer. When you have a decorative look of hard coat stucco, it's a blending of a look of, of masonry, of real stucco over block work, but it doesn't have the structural integrity. So in order for the stucco to bond, it needs to be fastened to a wire mesh and that wire mesh is then nailed or stapled to wood. So what most people don't always think when they talk or engage in our service is that stucco is stucco and they'll look, if you look to the right side of this, this adhered stone veneer, whether it's real stone or whether it's manufactured, if it's a thin veneer and it's applied to the wire mesh that you see on the left and a scratch coat of Portland These effectively so it's 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 real thin stone or manufactured stone thin veneer that are applied or stuck to the wall some people call it stick on stone right so this is a little bit more of uh, what you see before you get to that scratch coat in the preceding photo uh, we're trying to secure wire mesh to a wood substrate or something that is a fiberglass or something that is of drywall or gypsum board. If they get wet, they will suffer consequences, mold, rot, etc. So there needs to be a barrier in between. As I'm 59, as a young guy starting out in the masonry world, we used to just call it the vapor barrier. And the vapor barrier was classically tar paper, asphalt, mineral dipped, and that is what we call today, it's called the WRB, water resistant barrier. And that is the film or the uh, barrier that's installed before the wire mesh is there. 
And that's because stucco, even thin veneers, are subject to moisture penetration, wind-driven rain events, snow. It can get between those products and it can wet the substrate material. So the, the job here is to prevent any moisture from, from wetting that area. And if it does, we have this other device on the bottom in new code called a weep screed. A weep screed is a drainage tract that's at the base that allows any moisture that's filtrated through the system to actually void at the base. So we've got the substrate material, we have wire mesh, we have an application of a Portland cement scratch coat or its first coat. This is what it looks like. So this is traditional trowel action of Portland cement that you're applying over the wire mesh and that weather barrier or water barrier. This is what the finished products look together. So you have a stucco system and you have a thin adhered stone veneer. And in this case, it's dry laid, there's no mortar joint. This sometimes creates more problem in our industry when you don't have a mortar joint in there because it allows these voids or cavities to fill with water, snow, and a lot of times in, in cold climates, you have expansion and you have a lot of delamination or breaking of the stone. So these are the two real differences of EIFS system, uniform acrylic texture, uh, multiple colors, and effectively paint over an acrylic. In this, you've got a series of applications of Portland cement with the final coat being its color and texture. And in this case over here, we have the thin veneer stone that's been applied. So there are the two that we have. Uh, Shancy, I think I'll wait a couple minutes for the questions because I think now that we've talked about identifying the systems, I want to talk about the method of, of how we do the inspections based on these. That Absolutely. Good? Good. Sure. Okay. So, uh, you know, what type of testing instruments do we utilize and, and what inspection protocol is to be performed? And, and I've touched on some of these things. The, 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 the density and the thickness of the foam just by nature is an inch and a half versus most traditional you over wood and the feel is going to be at different depths so just on itself on its face by your initial drilling you're almost going to identify what type of system that you have so you're not predetermining it but what you're doing is you're trying to let all this other information this data come into you you don't just presume because it has an acrylic texture that it's an acrylic system it could be like whoever the uh, the participant was that asked about putting one application over something else. You have to let your tools tell you, but you also have to let your feel of having been in the industry let you know what the drill is telling you and at what depth. So let's talk about that. So we have options. Right? It's, you look to see what you have. You can yield a lot of information. Uh, when you do a visual, which is part of any inspection, whether it's a, a foregone conclusion that we're doing invasive or you're just trying to get a preliminary approach, we do walk and talks. We walk with the client, we walk with the homeowner, we walk with other inspectors. And what we're trying to do is get a general overview of what the home is showing. Uh, are we seeing any cracks, any breaching or bulging of the stucco? Just familiarizing ourselves with what looks like maybe paint or acrylic resin. Next thing that we have, we offer are, we have pinless devices, things that are not invasive. There are wall meters that literally you can touch on the surface. And there are also things that are perfect for when you know that you have masonry substrate, you're walking around and sometimes your hand and a, uh, a, a small mason's hammer, just tapping along the way gives you a better idea. And then in direct, opposite of this is the invasive. Regardless, invasive or non-invasive, they all start with the preliminary visual inspection. So the thing that you really gain from the invasive is you get real physical data. You get overall thickness of the stucco system. You get, which is also important, the resistance of the substrate, the firmness, or in many cases, the lack of soft wood rot, uh, decomposing, they're all things that are part of the physical data that we yield when we drill through the stucco system. 
And lastly, we have uh, moisture content and the report photos. So we're effectively mapping our findings each location at a time. And where we do that, I'll show you in a second. So this is what a visual site assessment looks like. This one I pull up onto a job site. I have to tell you, most homes don't look like this. This was a rarity. This is why we were called in. So you can see here, this is pretty heavy and it's not traditionally in the areas where you'll see in future uh, slides here, where this is typically the area we're drilling because this is where most moisture penetrates and sits at the sill locations of windows. This was an area on further evaluation. We were able to determine where it was from and where it was located, but we still did a full protocol all four sides of the home. These are also parts of where visual typical locations, again, that, that windows, that, that tiering that you see at the windows. You'll also see minor corning on diagonals. You'll see this cracking. And so a lot of the new codes have changed to prevent these things because we know the reasons why these things happen. And a lot of these are basic flashing details that were missed in the 80s and in the 90s. So now moving forward, we know better. Uh, this area is also, this is a ripe spot called a kick out. And it's an intersection where we have a roof and the vertical wall, sometimes called the gable wall. And if you notice all that cascading of water coming down, uh, typically the, the gutter does its job, but in lack of the downspout in some proximity, the moisture goes backwards. The running water goes backwards and literally penetrates through the stucco and, and creates lots of havoc in that area. And then sometimes you'll see areas here in the, uh, in the eaves of, uh, of homes on a gable wall. So this is, we're continuing with visible offers, right? This is a pinless device. I use this a lot. Uh, it is what's called a Tramex. It's a uh, moisture detection meter and it's pinless. And you literally can rub this on a wall and the analog meter will literally show you the ranges comparable to the national standard of what's acceptable in the green. You know, the, the, the speedometer here is going a little bit to the yellow orange. And then you start getting up into the red line where you're telling you you've got more active moisture. Good product, right? Pinless, not invasive, less threatening. This is the biggie. Here's an infrared device. These are two, $3,000 and everybody's got one on their truck. Great product. You can see the image here, right? Thermal imaging, infrared. Uh, it, it also is non-invasive. It's fabulous. It's got limitations just like everything does. So let's, let's show you that a little bit, right? So this is what a thermal imaging looks at at a window area. And what's interesting is that again, you're seeing these ranges in color and the ranges in color represent thermo, heat. So you have, if you look at the window, you'll see the bluer color, which is cooler. And you start to range in colors of, of yellow to orange to red, it's showing you more heat. If you really look at this, how I know how to interpret this, is that you can see these boxes. That's actually the framing bay from inside the home. The issue with the thermal imaging is that when you find out that you have wire mesh and Portland cement, it renders both of those two tools, the Tramex and the thermal imaging device, useless in diagnosing anything that is hard coat stucco, where there's wire mesh or where there is Portland cement applied. So you really have to have all of the tools in your toolbox and you effectively, when you arrive at the site, you need to prepare for anything and adapt to what you're doing. But this is the difference between non-invasive measures and then when we get to the traditional or the newer invasive testing. So what's that look like, right? Uh, it's exterior testing of stucco. It's done by drilling holes at suspect locations and really there's a protocol and I can elaborate based on some of the photos in, in a little bit. We're placing a moisture probe into the wall cavity and measuring the moisture content of the wood or the wall sheathing if it's something different, if it's gypsum board, et cetera. And we're using a device called a moisture meter. And what's that look like? Well, this is what it looks like. Masonry. Thanks for joining us in our next segment of invasive stucco inspections. Uh, so we just drilled in an area, a system where a lot of moisture intrusion occurs at the base of windows. There's aluminum siding that's been capped on this home. 
The first thing we typically do in our inspection is we gauge the thickness of the stucco. And at this point, we're at half inch. Today's current code is 7 8 7 inch. So this is a little light on the stucco thickness. The second, very important, is an SRT, structural resistance tester. It measures the pounds per square inch of resistance that the particle or the plywood sheeting is offering. 48 pounds per square inch. So the last thing that we do is we take our downforce moisture meter which has been calibrated for the OSB part of the board to be verified from an interior inspection. We've calibrated it. And our reading reads 9.5. 9.5 is our reading and under the current IRC code again 14% and below our acceptable moisture standards and such. The last thing we do is we spell Okay, so we're back live and uh, so you just got a demonstration of sort of the four portions of what we do. I think sometimes that video is, is short and brief and cuts right to the point. There's no fanfare, no, no fear. We don't, we don't work in fear. We work in education in our business. That's what we should all be doing and uh, effectively diagnosing what we're dealing with one drill at a time. That's different substrate will break where this pin will penetrate at different uh, rates. So you have to know which one that it is. That's why it's so important to diagnose what you have behind the stucco system. I can't stress that enough, right? This is what we do when we need to find out what it is. Most of the time, the interior of the home attic might show us something quickly, but this picture on the left actually shows, unfortunately, some damaged area, which is why we, we did the core sampling. We can see the tar paper, water, or weather barrier, and you can see all the shredding of the oriented strand board that took place. This device is uh, actually, uh, it's, it's a gauge, and it tells me the thickness of the stuff. Yeah, that's what they look like when they're done. So what you're really doing here is you don't just go back and give somebody overall, you're, you're mapping, you're diagnosing at key locations based on a protocol. And if you notice here, we're going right to that same location where the windows are. So we're moving. And this is what it looks like in a mapping. And by the way, this is the home gate system. So it's pretty dynamic. It allows us to be able to do all this and place these numbers. This isn't reading number 13 or number 12 or 11. This is the actual moisture reading that was registered from that device, from the Delmhorst. That photo, the photo. This is that stained area. And this, that's the highest that reading reads. That's active moisture. Right below it was where that core was sampling. The wood was rotting. When we drilled, there was no even putting a moisture reader below it. It drilled right through the substrate material. And to the left of it, we read a 24.6. The purpose of this is you just don't read one reading and walk away. You're trying to get a better handle on the, on the gravity or the depth or the width of how much area has been damaged. That's called mapping. That's what we do. So here's a, a dynamic. where the picture says the thousand words. There's my meter, there's the stained area, and it's showing you exactly what that instrument read. And there's the SRT device that shows that it broke at 12 PSI in the wall taking pictures. You get pretty uh, good with dexterity of holding a camera and uh, taking pictures while you're up on a ladder. It's pretty, uh, pretty interesting uh, set of skill sets you learn, but uh, that's what we do. Here's another showing of, uh, of another core sample. And sometimes we try to show this to actually show what weather barriers there, whether it was something newer or whether it's an older standard. 
This is the interior of the wall, which we typically don't get to see. We were asked to go back afterwards when their plumber came in. This was a leak, not traditionally caused by stucco, but the stucco was impacted. This was actually caused by a, uh, a uh, shower stall system that was leaking. Here's another demonstration of the photo of what the SRT looks like. More confirmed damage. So new solutions from new problems. We now have a new series of methods of, in, of installation of flashing, how we install windows, how we do this house wrap, building paper, weep screens, we touched on them. This is now really what the new program looks like right here. You've got the substrate material, in this case it's wood. You have the drainage track on the bottom of what we call the weep screed. You have the water resistant, the tar paper barrier. In this case, this is an EI. is the fiberglass of the EIFS system. So I'm just going to show you what some of these look like before and after, whether it's hard coat stucco or whether it's the EIFS system. This is what they look like, whether it's new again to the codes or whether they're remediating and replacing from an older system that had damage. This is what I encounter quite frequently here, stucco removal and partial remediation. And Chancey, how are we doing on time? We've got uh, 2.40 into the hour. Do you want me to take some questions now? Yeah, I think so. Um, yeah, we've got about just under 20 minutes. Okay. Um, what I have here is, let's see, um, a couple of people asking about describing the different types of common or larger cracks. What do they indicate structurally? You may have discussed that. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, Earlier, you showed some pictures. Remember the, the yellow mesh stuff around the windows? Yes. What, what, is, that, uh, what is that called again? So, what is that? So it's called back wrapping. So when this, this whole combination of EIFS systems, similar to, to the metal or the galvanized wire mesh for stucco, you're embedding one thing into the next. So when you apply, when you're installing the, the key of all this, is that you have to play nicely with all the other building disciplines. You're just not a stucco guy installing. You're working with window installers. You're working with framing contractors. You're working with roofing people. So this whole dynamic of somebody else has to deal with this, you should all be a, a orchestration. It should all be you know, a well-honed -filed, filed, well uh, machine. Okay. Um, I have a couple of questions about Hard coat stucco, I, I call modern three coat stucco hard coat Purpose stucco. Purpose that there's going to be, you're going to be using together this, uh, this base coat and it's not ready for the next step. I wanted to let you see it in its phase. Okay. The picture I have up right now shows a lot of red tape <laughs> and I don't mean uh -huh. bureaucratic. <laughs> it's red tape and there's actually plastic film in front of all the windows because as they're reinstalling this product, they're working on some areas that the home is not being remediated. There's some areas that were fine. So they're cleaning and keeping the areas clean as they go. It's a standard practice or should be if you're ever dealing with contractors. Okay. Right. And right, lastly, let's... cracks. Uh, cracks are an inherent risk of stucco. It, it happens. Uh, you know, without being, you know, all the specifics of it, if it's thicker than a dime and you can really, it's breaching where you see tearing in combination with bulging or very elongated vertical or diagonal cracks, that's an indicator of the system. That's not typically where we drill, but there's times where I'll drill there anyway, just to have a random field reading to see what that crack may have let in, okay? Okay. I think I'm gonna uh, go a little further on. We're, we're moving pretty good here, but I just wanna make sure I save for any other further questions, if that's okay. Okay, that's fine. I, I have more, but we can wait till we get towards the end. Okay. I know you have a lot of slides. Yep, good. Cool. Mm -hmm. right. So this is now some of the new stuff. This is that same wire mesh, you know, the whole thing. This is what a kick out diverter now, per the code in 2004 and forward. This is what it looks like before the stucco is applied. This is what it looks like after the fact. So now all that, that deluge or that cascading of rain is, is kicked out or, or diverted into the gutter downspout area and it minimizes the concerns we have here, right? Moving forward. This is critical uh, new installation of windows. And not only are we doing head flashing above the window to protect 
the moisture as it comes in, but we're actually, we're gonna say this properly, we're gonna seal the sill. So it's known in the professional terms as a sill pan. Sill pans in the past used to be aluminum, uh, copper, all the rest of it. Today, they have these products that are like a uh, brand name is called Grace Tape. And they're literally release film that any nailing that you do, it it's, itself seals the staple head or the nail head. It's really evolving as a, as a building uh, industry. This is what it looks like at the end. Here's the head flashing installed, finished view of a window. This is the easy bead because whenever we have transitions of aluminum, vinyl, wood, stucco, stone, brick, all of them are dissimilar products and they crack or expand and move at different intervals. So as a result, the industry's found that it's best to have uh, what we call an easy bead or a caulk or a casing bead at all these perimeters of these transitions. This is what it looks like before stucco is applied. And this is what it looks like at the end. So now you'll see the window has a head flashing above and a caulk casing bead at the vertical, what we call the sash. Any transitions now of stucco to stone, and this is thin veneer or manufactured stone, there's a weed moisture that's coming down the way as opposed to working its way behind the stucco. So again, we continue with newer applications before and after. This is the weep screed at the base of the stucco. Moving forward, this is a remediation contract. And this was stucco applied directly over a cinder block basement. So the transition of the rim band, the wood transition of framing begins right here. So this contractor was actually putting in the weep screed at the base and he's gonna stucco the same finished color here as here. The difference is going to be at that transition, there's going to be weep holes on the bottom like this. And this allows the void, any moisture that's built up or penetrated through the walls, allows it to void. And it actually just gives, in general, an air space to allow the breathing to take place to minimize moisture buildup. Last thing we all want to touch on, expansion joints. They're not always the prettiest. It's a new code requirement. This is a three, almost four story home I did about four months ago. And you can see all this, but the purpose is because you've got such an expanse of home and such minimum amount of windows, there's a higher likelihood of cracking that one of our last uh, questions was, you see lots of cracking that takes place. By creating expansion joints and installing them within the system, it's allowing you to work to an area should a crack develop that you don't have to take all the rest of the stucco off. You can work or control to an area and isolate the areas of repair. This area here, this horizontal line is also the same stucco applied to the rest here, but this was the foundation above. It was a walkout basement. So there was this much stucco that was above that we don't do testing on because the stucco applied to the concrete foundation is cosmetic. That's pretty much the, the, the new versus old evolution of, of stucco uh, in its traditional sense over masonry, uh, newer sense of hard coat, and then of course the evolution of polymers and resins. Uh, and here's what expansion control joints look like up close. Here's what they look like when they're done. And I think I'll take a couple questions and I just want to get into the home gauge, just the platform stuff and things that make my life easier on site. Okay. All right, let's see here. Um, I have a few here. Mm. Let's see, one sec, I'm sorry. At the end dam, such as the ends of the drip cap flashings, is that are end dams required in all areas, such as the end ends of the drip cap flashing? They are, they are. Okay. The big challenge we have in our, in our industry is that you're dealing with homes that can post date the code and should have them and may not. Uh, they're more subject to a lot of the, uh, the, the class actions that some of you may have heard about, uh, especially in the region that, that we offer our services. Uh, but there's a lot of homes that are built in the 1960s and 70s and have fared very well from our inspection. It's hard to mandate that somebody 
retrofit something that's functioning well and potentially reopen something that's never had damage in 40 years. It's a, it's a very, uh, you know, you have to challenge that as, as an inspector. You just can't, you know, it's, it's 40 years old and you need to put something new in there. You have to identify what you're dealing with. Next question. Uh, what are your thoughts about closed systems? The closed system guidelines state that an inspector should not recommend repairs according to the design standards. Yeah, I, uh, I have uh, in, in my, I created my, my language, Shancy, as you know, uh, a lot of this is, you know, in the event that language, in the event that damage is found and, and needs to be repaired or is extensive, it's our recommendation that you apply the new building code to benefit from all the new information that we know. But if there's no damage that's occurred, we don't have that ability to recommend a system that's functioning well just because it's 40 years old and it predates all of it. It sort of touches what I just discussed before. Sure. Okay. Um, the traditional st stucco, it sometimes gets a lot of hairline cracks. Is that the same for yeah. Ethis? Oop, did I lose you? A little bit. I heard about the uh, traditional hair, uh, hairline cracking. Okay. Um, it, the ha traditional hairline cracking in, in this traditional stucco, does Ethis do the same thing? Uh, they all crack regardless. Sometimes in an, in an EVE system, that can be an indicator of more uh, issues. And, and this probably isn't the time to talk about all of it, but there can be shear, there can be delamination, there can be movement of the system that the fasteners weren't there. So if you see deep shearing or deep cracking, it's more of an indicator of, a, uh, of an application problem uh, as opposed to when you see a lot of deep staining around the windows, which is normally moisture penetrating because of window install or, uh, you know, uh, moisture access. Okay. Um, I have, uh, I'm just going to take a few more questions. Yep. And, and uh, Michael, if, if you're willing to share your email, if people have any kind sure. of questions for you later, and Kate, we're going to miss some just because of the time, but yep. I'll ask it like a couple, three more, and then you can move on to your, your talk about how you developed your report or however, whatever else you want to cover. Um, I have two questions about hard coat stucco. I call modern three coat stucco hard coat stucco. Is that accurate? Yes. Okay. It's there's, there's another hard coat stucco that people sometimes misidentify. It's called a one coat, W-O-C-S, one coat system. And it's literally stucco applied the first coat, the scratch coat to the wire. And sometimes people are adding texture right to it. In some cases, I can literally see the wire mesh <laughs> when I walk up to the home. It's wow. Like this. Okay. Um, the other question about the hard coat was, oh, is hard coat stucco also considered synthetic stucco? I couldn't hear that. Is hard sorry, coat stucco, that. That, that's okay. Is hard coat stucco still considered, uh, also considered synthetic stucco? You know, if, if there, there's polymers that are added to the, to the cement, the pre-blended, uh, I don't want to say yes or no on that one, but truly synthetic is usually when you have the, the acrylic uh, or at least part of it that's incorporated into your system. I still consider hard coat as something separate because you've got those cementitious products that you're talking about. Okay. And some of the other questions are about how you get trained, uh, uh, other specific types of closed systems. Yep. But I feel like we'll probably wind up going too deep into those. So I do. Um, and I think what I want to leave everybody with this too is, Thank you for having me today, first of all. I'm gonna leave you my website, email, drop me a line, it would be great. Um, I'm a member of EDI, which is the national group that, that creates the credentials for all of us inspectors that, that specialize in stucco and EIFS. Uh, I'm proud of my membership with them, proud to be an instructor for them as well. Uh, so I'll leave that with you and I'd be happy to talk with people individually. If you wanna set up group sessions, happy to do that too. We love to educate people and we want better in, inspectors that are out there, right? Excellent, so excellent. We'll go to this real quick. So this is the home gauge system that you all have. And this is what it looks like when I get there, right? Traditional PC desktop. What I have to tell you, what I really love about this is I mentioned about the precarious, you know, uh, areas that you get into when you're up on a ladder with tools and tool belt and caulking and you know, all drills. It gets to be pretty dicey when you're up on a ladder. But what's really nice is this device, tablet or the companion on your phone, allows you to take a lot of those really detailed pictures 
And my phone, I actually taught it that I can speak and say smile or cheese and it'll allow me to do something with one less finger that I have to take off of something else. So this is what I love about the system. It's really allowed me to progress with my business. And I just wanted to share that. So, you know, we've got some things that we've tailored again offline. If you want to chat with me, I'm happy to do that and, uh, you know, be part of the, the team here and develop some things moving forward. Awesome. This is, again, some of the dynamics of what it does. Some of the other things that I had prior to this, you could do this, but, you know, this is what's sort of important when you're, you know, really, you're not trying to scare, but you're trying to really drive the point home. This area's got some serious damage. No resistance. You didn't even get a moisture reading. When I drilled, the wood rot was so prolific at each one of these areas, the moisture reading wasn't even going to happen because the wood was rotted. There's no question you're replacing all this. You can't candy coat it. But seeing something like this is dynamic enough for, for a client that's never seen an inspection to understand we got some concerns here. Okay. And I think I'll close with this. This is, I'm going to leave this on the screen for a little bit. And unless we have the time for another question, I think we got three minutes, Chancy. I think we're, we hit our target. Let me know if you'd like any other questions. No, no, you're good. You, you run with it. Okay. So we're, I'm good here. I'm going to leave this up and, uh, you know, I just, again, I, I love what I do, masonry work since 1987, probably 10 years before that, working my way through the trades, college graduate in Pennsylvania, LaSalle College. Uh, we only do stucco inspection, EIFS systems. Uh, we do consults, but we don't do the work anymore. We feel it's a conflict of interest. So when we're there, we're solutions experts. That's what we specialize in. We don't just go there, do your inspection, done with it. There's a lot of times with our background where people really, you know, ask us to dig deep into the weeds and help them understand where they're at. So just thank you everybody for having me today. And I hope to continue doing these things in the future. Thank you so much, Michael. I mean, as I mentioned earlier, Michael and I have worked a lot together and I have to say, if he can get me to understand some of this stuff, he really gave me many aha moments in the times that we worked together. And thank you so much for, um, for taking time out of your day and doing this. It, it, I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. We had an excellent showing. You had upwards of 120 people in this session. So Fabulous. that's awesome. Thank you all so much. It was my pleasure. Look forward to Thanks. working with you. Thank you. Talk soon. Bye, Shanti. Thank you.